Okay. Yeah, I am. Good morning, everyone. Agriculture, being the primary sector of Indian economy, requires an immediate revolution with the help of robotics and Internet of Things. We are extremely delighted to present to you our next speaker, Mr. Sneha Kumar Kadam, who has immense experience in the field of agriculture. He is an agropreneur, a statistician, exporter, and many more. He completed his master's in actuarial science from Bishop Heber College and is also a part of the Institute of Actuaries of India. He carries with him a rich experience in the field of business development and analytics. He currently serves as the principal and managing director of Swami Shri Exports Imports Private Limited and Alpha Predictions, where he helps in enhancing the agriculture ecosystem by introducing AI-based precision agriculture technology and a buyback model for the much needed development in the Indian rural agrarian sector. We are really grateful, sir, that you gave us your precious time for our session. Without further ado, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Shaurya. Looks like you have uh, gone through my LinkedIn profile thoroughly. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so uh, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Dr. Snehal Kumakadam. Uh, currently, we are working on a precision farming technology and a buyback model, which will enhance not just uh, the living li lifestyle of a farmer, but also the quality of a soil. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll talk, I'll start my conversation uh, from robotics and then I'll jump on the AI. Okay, is that fine? Yeah, totally fine, sir. Uh, I believe it, it should be a two-way communication. If someone has any problem or an issue or a question, queries, just let me know on a call. Sure, sir. Okay. So, yeah, uh, as Shora just mentioned, agriculture is one of the prime uh, industry in India, yet it is disorganized. Nobody have ever dared to organize the sector thoroughly. Yeah, there are many uh, stakeholders in the industry who are working very nicely, but everyone is working independently and not have consolidated anything at such place. So what we are working, we are working on a technology where we can consolidate every stakeholder of agricultural industry at one platform and the farmer will, farmer's life will be enhanced a bit. Okay. So uh, here I would say robotics and AI are playing a major role. Uh, talking about robotics, can just can let anyone know me the problems that the agricultural industry is facing right now? Basically, like farmers are not oh, able yeah, to farmers, farmers. Yeah, are... so farmers are not able to sell their produce at a better price to the yeah. wholesale market. So, okay. like we have mandis, but mm -hmm. we don't really have uh, a proper system to uh, have a fair chance of price discovery and all those things. Okay. So we can develop a model for uh, discovery of price on a, a complete system in so, which is based on state-wise distribution of food patterns and all those things. Okay, so we'll note down the first problem that a farmer is facing is a price, okay? Can anyone know, uh, let me know the second problem that a farmer is facing? Apart from price, or uh, are we all agreeing that price is the only problem? See, uh, so sometimes they also face uh, like what plants and what crops is are best for their soil, like the field okay. they are plowing in. So and, the choosing uh, the right field for the yeah. uh, as per season is a second problem that we are yeah. mentioning, right? Yeah. The third problem is paste. Paste, okay. Paste or insects. Insects. It's the third insects. problem. Insecticide, pesticides. So these are the uh, cause. These are the uh, remedies for this paste and insects. So yeah. Uh, Robotics will play a major role when it comes to pesticides and insecticides. Because uh, when 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 I work on the ground, I always have uh, no. I, I always face the main problem is labor. The farmer is putting one third of his cost on just labor. So if we try to minimize that labor cost by robotics, don't you think it will be a no big hit for the industry? Yeah. Like so people have started using drones. Okay, people have st already started using drones. 
even in some part of Maharashtra, also in Karnataka, you can see automated drips. So the automation have started somewhere, but don't you think it's, it is now it is just a start and we can do many more into it. Yeah, it's like uh, yeah. all the subsystems are developed individually. Right. We now have to integrate them to make a perfect integrate model. Them. So, right. So uh, a, a drone or a, what do you say, a, a drone based uh, spraying or a, a, let's say a precision agriculture spraying would able to reduce the cost by 30% for the farm. So this is the saving that a farmer get. Okay. If he's spending 100 rupees on the spraying and using your technology, the farmer will be able to spray, will be able to put just 70 rupees of his expenses. So he is saving 30 rupees. Okay. And at the same time, when we are introducing all the robotics and AI to the agricultural, we are saving their operational costs too. Because we are not going to spray on the whole farm, right? We're going to use the image detection analysis or it's a neural network or some, some so another sort of AI to identify where the ex exact problem is. And we're going to spray on this on that particular space itself, right? And this is the technology that I'm looking forward. And no, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of you at all of you who will help me to develop all these technologies so that we can actually help a farmer. Okay, so this is the second point. So uh, when it comes to AI in agriculture, most of the time AI is used in Indian agriculture system through remote sensing. So what is remote sensing? So basically... I, I, I want more answers from, not just from Shara. I just, I want some more participants to jump in. Sure, you can talk definitely, but okay. I want more answers. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's being streamed live on YouTube. So mm -hmm. uh, if there are any answers from the live comments, I'll send it to you. Okay. So, uh, so when I say uh, remote sensing, remote sensing is, it, remote sensing has several advantages in the field of uh, agronomical research purpose. The assessment of a crop conopies have provided valuable insights in the agricultural or economic parameters. The remote sensing play a significant role in the crop classification, the problem that we just discussed, crop monitoring, and the yield assessment. So what is yield assessment? Yield assessment is a forecast of a farm where we will have a number that how much yield that we are actually assess, actually be having in the particular season so that we can manage our inventories. Okay. So the use of remote sensing is necessary in the field of agronomical research because it, they have a highly vulnerable to variation in soil, climate, and other physiochemical changes. Okay. So remote sensing, it's, it's, uh, it's particularly in an art and a science of a gathering information about the objects or uh, area of the real world at a distance without coming into the direct physical contact with the object under study. You understand it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, remote sensing, it's, it's, it's particularly have uh, a lot of advantages in the field of agronomical research purpose. Okay. The assessment of agricultural crop canopies has provided a valuable insights in the agronomic parameters. So remote sensing plays a significant role in the crop classification, crop monitoring, and yield assessment. So when I say uh, crop classification is the first problem that we just discussed, okay? Crop monitoring for the price purpose and uh, definitely as per the soil quality and the water quality will definitely have a crop, uh, you know, some uh, effects on the crop. So we'll go, we're gonna monitor all those effects, all those results, and hence the final will be the yield. So yield will get assessed. So we will have a number that how much yield that we'll be having in a farm per season so that we can manage all our inventories. Okay. So when I say inventories, it means the transportation, the packaging, and everything. Okay. So uh, remote sensing, it's, it's uh, an art and a science of gathering information. The more we grow, the more we know. So we just need to grow on the farm. 
and whatever we are growing in the farm we just need to track every single information that is happening in the farm through sensors through satellite through you no know, infrared microwaves we have a, a different uh, tools and uh, you no know, devices to measure all these parameters and we're going to use them right so yes sir yeah so once we have a typical response of the target for this wavelength region is are different so they are used for the distinguished vegetation bare soil soil you know water and other similar features so uh, i'll explain what it exactly means uh, when we say precision agricultural technology what does it actually mean to you so we are not uh, operating on the entire field but okay. specific uh, crops and plants on a particular area and according okay. to that we are going to operate for example if we have to sp uh, spray pesticides we are not going to spray it all over the field mm -hmm. we are going to uh, spray it over the affected area only and that as you told like we have drones they have video cameras and from that we can determine which crops are affected by the pest or not okay so on so, that area it will yeah. get sprayed automatically mm -hmm. okay 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 great great that's that's a wonderful question uh gis is particularly uh, identification of a land okay so you have that uh, you have a lat lawn of the particular land and uh, through satellite you can when you uh, give this no we 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 need to develop few codes where we will be able to fetch the satellite information through this lat lawn of a particular land and once we do that we'll have a satellite images of particular of that land and then we can put different uh, uh, let's say uh, different uh, filters uh, on on the image and we'll be able to fetch uh, different information like ndvi so ndvi is is, is index vegetation index right so yeah so remote sensing uh, is related to gis in this form where will be uh, we have a authority to fetch more information to know more data and then we need to arrange it so basically uh, remote sensing or precision agriculture technology it means uh, see, land is basically a oh, yield is basically a combination of three main parameters first is weather the next is soil the third is water we just need to balance all this these three parameters so the current practices that a farmer is doing in the farm is basically uh, way, they are very bad the total yield that a farmer will is able to produce is a 40% capacity of the whole land so if we balance soil water and weather somehow we'll be able to you no know, produce more in the farm because that's how we're going to give exact nutrients to the particular crop and where when we are giving exact nutrients to a crop the germination or or say the growth of a crop gets boosted and that's how the farmer will also get more yield the current practices that we are doing in the farm uh, are, will have been able to give 40% more results to a farmer just by keeping a balance of a uh, soil water and uh, pesticides or weather okay so yeah whether we can we have a number of numerical data so we can predict it right through sensors and, uh, of, through sensors yeah, and, or satellite uh, yeah yeah you're saying something yeah yeah and we can also use that with the data to uh, uh, to tell the farmer that exactly. we need not water and exactly. whatever we have the automatic irrigation system so we right. can take that with the data as well to De right. depict and uh, determine when to water the plants how much to right. water the plants right so uh, we all have seen the dew d e w dew right yeah so what is dew it's it's basically a water right so in yes. winter when we have a lot of dew in the farm irrespective, irrespective of the amount of dew that we had in a farm we water the whole farm the regular way that we have been informed right so what we are doing here we are giving extra water to the crop the 
only man can eat more than what he wants to eat or what his capacity is but the crops they're not like that the if we give them something extra the adverse effect is definitely will be definitely will be there so by giving exact nutrients to a crop we'll be able to optimize the growth of, sorry the growth of a crop and hence the production on the same time if you are not giving the crop okay the uh, the extra water or say it's extra pesticides you're going to save a lot of money right so this is how remote sensing is playing a major role into agriculture okay so for the robotics we have a lot many options so there are drones we all have seen a all have seen a machine uh, in the wheat farm where the the, the crop gets automatically you know uh, pulled out Fisher of the uh, yeah precious harvesters so the, a lot of things are auto, are already there but somewhere we just need to come forward and solve or say major problems or, or at least we need to consolidate all these stakeholders at one place where if you want this okay you have this if you want a harvester you have a harvester if you need some technology yes we have a technology so we just need to provide all these stakeholders a platform to provide their respective uh, technologies or say services to a farmer so this is the uh, and i feel uh, through ida find we able to will be able to you know identify some sort of platforms that someone might be thinking and yeah that's uh, that's what is all about uh, robotics and ai in agriculture but uh, so the problem we are right definitely yeah definitely that's right thank you thank you so much sir so i can uh, cut the call i can cut the call right yeah i have a, a small presentation so i just up to i mean i just share the screen yeah just a minute sure thanks sure sure sure
morning, everyone. We are extremely delighted to present to you our speaker for healthcare and soft robotics, Mr. Saurav Karmakar, who is the Indian chapter chair of Space Dinosaur International and the current serving CEO of Infinos Technologies LLP. He completed his bachelor's degree in electronics and communication engineering at St. Peter's Institute of Higher Education and Research. He is researching soft and flexible robotics and aims to build hybrid, origami, and soft robots for medtech, defense, and aerospace applications. He also is working to build a renewable energy-based portable device for biotech applications and educational tools for the medical and specially able students with customized AR and robotic solutions. We are indeed grateful to you, sir, for taking out time to do this session. Without further ado, over to you, sir. So, am I visible? So good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to join all of you. I think it was really interesting uh, sitting in home and having some sort of idea, idea thon or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, hackathon. Uh, so your people are doing a great job and uh, also good luck to all participants of all categories. So today I'm going to present something about soft robotics. Uh, this is very, uh, maybe very new idea or maybe uh, you haven't heard of it also. I'm not sure, uh, but one thing I can say that this is something a very, uh, it's a kind of integrated area, you can say, where people can do wonders, and it's a very new area. So there are a lot of opportunities from research, from maybe product, from maybe some other areas, and it's a very combination of biomedical, uh, material science, robotics, engineering, physics, everything. So it's like very, like, you know, very uh, fun kind of areas, you can say. So I'll just present a short, uh, you know, so you can have a, a glimpse of what's happening around the world in the past few years. So can you see my screen? Please let me know once my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll just flip to page. Okay. okay, so yeah, so this is the topic soft robotics and healthcare. Uh, when I'm talking about soft robotics, it's not only like just the uh, word, like, you know, literal meaning, it's also something like which is not a rigid body okay so when i'm talking about soft robots or soft robotics applications it's something like which is not fundamentally it is not rigid it's not like hard like plastic or metallic uh, kind of robot and it is also very easy to move it has a lot of flexibility or degree of freedom and also uh, the capacity okay, the capacity to grasp something and uh, you know, bending past possibilities. I'm not talking about exactly the physical bending possibilities and the, you know, uh, the sustainability factor, the waterproof. In a lot of cases, it is far ahead than normal or traditional rigid robots, actually. And the same for the healthcare. So today I'll be talking very few examples, which is like, you know, one of the remarkable uh, research uh, done by different, different countries, different, different institutes. So today I'll be talking about several things and I will also tell what I am doing at the end. So, Soft robotic gloves, uh, exosuit, millibot I'll show, and uh, something about magnetic control. Okay, some companies are also there, soft robotic corporation, and yeah, other examples. So if you see this slide, this is about uh, how we can do some soft robotic gloves. Nowadays, we know that exoskeleton is coming. People have seen that metallic exoskeleton, which is able to, uh, you know, uh, bear a lot of payload. Like it can actually handle a lot of payload, even including human body payload or maybe some extra. Even you might have seen in Avatar also some sort of this. It's not that is not exactly the exoskeleton, but it's kind of like that. 
uh, it's kind of exoskeleton warships method. Up here I'm talking only about exoskeleton without warships. So it is actually exoskeleton clothes, basically. It is handled Harvard University, and they are actually doing something like let's say there are a lot of people who has their palm or fingers, basically the this part of uh, this ring part of the hand is not functioning properly. Okay, or vibration or something they can't hold. A lot of things happen right in the medical uh, scenario. So scientists have introduced this kind of sen like sensorized uh, soft orthotic gloves, which is very lightweight and it is very flexible. It is able to you know bend like degree of freedom is high, so you can actually bend anywhere. And even it is very lightweight. That's one of the major things. And even if you see the structure, it is mostly made of uh, elastic fiber or silicone or something soft kind of materials, so rubber materials. So uh, there is a possibility to withstand the water also, which is not possible in case of the traditional robots and in the uh, you know, uh, the bottom you can find the uh, images where uh, you can see people can actually grip various type of objects if you imagine that any kind of gripper or any kind of soft robotic uh, sorry uh, normal robotic exoskeleton there you can see that there is a limitation of folding like that means how much it will open or bend so if it is zero means zero and 90 means 90 or 180 means 20 so it is like closing and opening is like fixed so it won't be like in between but in this case it is like having huge advantage actually that's what the fantastic thing people have uh, you know uh, like about the soft robotics next is soft robotics access solutions or access suits so it is here also it is also done by Harvard University basically what they are doing is again uh, if you see about think about elderly people they can't actually carry heavy load okay but they need something which uh, make them to walk stand maybe walk through the stairs maybe and maybe up down through the stairs multiple times and even if they need to carry some sort of stuffs maybe they can carry as well so this is like a combo where it's completely sensorized and then we can see that how it can actually help them and the fantastic thing is due to the elasticity and all these sort of uh, properties of certain materials it is able to you know help you to get more payload okay so the advantage is you're not carrying payload of the exoskeleton or episode, but you're carrying the payload which is added, okay, due to the exosuit or exoskeleton. So that's a great advantage actually for any uh, elderly people. Even if you see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, disabled people or maybe some people got, I mean, some sort of bad, uh, you know, uh, timing, maybe accident or something. So they can also use this and they can actually work. So it's a in, like great innovation for healthcare and people are actually doing great for that. Obviously, it has to be commercialized with some of the countries or some of the companies are trying to do that, but uh, this is, I think, not the state of art definition. Next, I'm coming to the millipot. Millipot is a very, very tiny bot. Uh, you can even think like maybe 10% uh, of a coin, maybe some sort of. Okay. You can find everything on the book, so it's nothing to worry. Uh, so this is something like a millibot, which can go into the intestine body and carry some sort of small payload, a small capsule, or maybe they can actually uh, carry some sort of, uh, you know, carry or you can say better to like grip, uh, grip something or grasp something inside the body and bring it out. So it's a very endoscopic things, but it is the advantages when not using any kind of tool. That means we're not using any kind of, let's say, um, you know, endoscopic Tool. It's called telescopic screws and all these things in medical industry. Telescopic, uh, in most little telescope, or this they are using in endoscopic surgery or minimally invasive surgery, okay, or laparoscopic surgery. A lot of cases you can find that kind of tube or rod made of metal, and there is a gripper and all which is metal again, and then they are actually trying to bring something out, maybe stones of some sort of parts or, or some sort of you know, clogged place they want to, you know. Um, like make it like free so a lot of things are there but here we see it's a very tiny robot which can carry some capsule also and if you see the third image this one it's a very tiny if you imagine this is like one of the body parts for example and see the size so it can carry actually a lot of things and uh, it can bring it out also and it can be controlled from outside so that's one of the best things are done by max Planck institute okay. next something is uh, again very interesting uh, it's actually magnetically controlled and it's a very special uh, you know, thread you can say, okay. So it's a thread or you can also tell in a robotic uh, you know, term continuum manipulator uh, or maybe uh, like you know, flexible manipulator for just for your simple way to uh, you know, explain it. So 
this is a kind of threat which can be magnetically controlled and it is used uh, to you know uh, deliver this clock reducing therapies basically so there are a lot of cases we see that blood flows and all, all this kind of things happen right so it is able to make it vanish or maybe she's some sort of you uh, know make it the uh, channel through the some sort of uh, part of our body it's not only for brain it can also be for any other places like uh, some sort of uh, uh, urethra or some other places where right? like some sort of clog or some sort of blockage is there so we can actually send it and we can try to remove that clog or we can bring it out also maybe with some sort of paper with it so this is another idea it is done by mit next is i will talk about a company so soft company corporation is in us and then they have done a very nice job imagine that any kind of delicate item okay which is like food industry or maybe some sort of medical industry right or where you have lot of delicate items or tissue or maybe cake or maybe uh, eggs as per the pictures in the given so these are very delicate now you imagine that you want to carry it for certain distance a to b uh, you know distance and there you are using metallic or wooden or plastic kind of paper for example then what will happen they can actually make crack or if the pressure or the force is little bit more on that particular object there is a possibility of damage and that is like maybe high value object or maybe something very rare object right we don't know so for that case they introduced this actually done by one of the greatest scientists in harvard professor weisser i think and uh, then they have uh, you know, initiated as a company maybe or they have various company for this such for software building corporation they have built a fantastic gripper which can actually carry different kind of uh, so, like you know delicate items for example cake or food industry you can find a lot of application of it and it's become more and more smart so they can actually do it faster with certain manipulators and it is like trying to be universal so it can be added to different manipulators it can be operated anywhere so one of the best thing is this i think last i think i will tell about other uh, soft robotic application so imagine this is like a universal gripper which can grasp any kind of objects this is made by italian so technology they have made up op- by instead of the first tentacles okay with shape of the aloe and silicone based gripper so this is like inspired from the uh, trunk of elephant so you can see it is also we can see as a continuum manipulator uh, this can be actuated with thread or cable or tendon or basically motor driven tendon driven system it can also be actuated with uh, something called shape and the alloy where it can also be actuated with different kind of structures where you would you know actuate as per the structural uh, you know uh, calculations so this is fantastic also if you see the second uh, the t image it can control by maybe pneumatics pneumatic is a fantastic thing that people have done so imagine this one it's a hollow tube or this one is a hollow tube you can actually put air and then you can actually control it so and then you can actuate in different direction as per your actuation pressure and all sort of all sort of things are there actually so uh, the way of actuation also important here and you can see this is operated under water you can't imagine the same thing with a rigid body robots because a lot of electronics inside but there is no coating required so that is a very fantastic uh, thing you, you can see if in lot of cases when you can see except the medical industry if you see about the payload carrying capacity and all soft robotic artificial muscles are there or in many other cases they can actually pick up a huge uh, you know uh, payloads compared to the rigid body according to the same maybe size shape or the uh, you know mass or weight of it actually if you see that the next thing is called uh, it's a kind of quadruped uh, you can find it's made by a uh, rubber shipper from cornell university and it is able to work it's one of the finest or one of, you can say the one of the uh, primary soft robotic uh, you know it's soft robotic quadruped you can say uh, and it is one of the best things uh, people when you see you know, like nowadays we see in the youtube video that eye catching or relief video so for me so see this video i feel very happy like how nicely it's walking through different uh, obstacles and it can actually if you make it more smarter like it can actually automatically detect the obstacle and it can also uh, avoid it so maybe you can use some sort of computer vision robotics and all sort of things the next thing is this is it's bio inspired robot it is made from the worm or thorn or inch worm and it is also made of shape and the other plus different kind of uh, elastic uh, or rubber kind of Now, some sort of clothing or some sort of sheets, right? So this is what here they are doing. Is it's a kind of elastic material, a 
Okay, that's good. Quickly, actually, they use some sort of uh, check on the alloy. Very tiny, but maybe 0.25 mm uh, dia uh, shape on the alloy wires, and then it can actually actuate. So you, there you use the battery, you can uh, use it directly. So it can actually actuate as per their own uh, requirement, and it can it can actually also carry payload. So a lot of cases you can see. So this is like the short presentation from my side, and I'm open to the questions. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, I don't see any uh, soft robotic uh, course because it's a very research-oriented uh, area at the moment. But if you're talking about compliant mechanism, it's a, it's a very integrated course, okay? So you can't, uh, you know, make it very specific. So if you want to do the soft robots, first you have to know material science. Second, you have to know that robotics, how the robotics are happening. Third, you have to know about the sensors. So these three elements are very important. What we can do, like if you have the fundamental courses along with that, if you want to take some independent study at the moment in the different uh, universities or institutes, there you can add and you can go ahead with what is the state of art is happening at the moment in the industry or you know academics, and based on that, you can carry this kind of things. I mean, at the moment, it's not there, but yeah, this is hopefully in future it will be possible. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, and, and last, I will also tell about my uh, research. I didn't mention that. So, uh, so I'm actually doing research on soft robotics in healthcare, basically for endoscopic uh, surgery or endoscopic surgical tool. And also, one of the areas is like soft robotics for space. When I'm talking about soft robots, not always it is like the rubber mitt, but sometimes it's like hybrid soft robots where we mix both rigid and soft, and then we use it as per our requirement. We uh, focus it on the sensors and many other cases. Which increase the you know sustainability in the uh, different uh, uh, what can I say maybe unknown environment like let's say uh, space uh, or space surface explorations and all and there you use this kind of things uh, it's fantastic to manage and uh, maybe it's really less cost or cost effective so uh, we can deploy a lot of more and even if you think about the psychological perspective of any I've been in different space related research and uh, organizations collaboration with ISA or many other people. So I've seen that there, uh, even if you've heard of something called Mars Analog Mission, uh, it's happens in US and many other places. So what they do, they make some simulation hub uh, where they stay for uh, let's say a certain period of time and then they make it like a astronauts, okay, astronauts or astronauts because of Mars. And then they try to train them such a way that in the communication will be delay of 44 minutes and all these things which imagining that we are in earth and these people are in mars and then how we are communicating and all the things that are there so there psychologically soft robot can help them to imagine that this is something like let's say there's a dog or some sort of uh, you know artificial robots which is made of soft robots which has which is having some bio inspiration or bio inspired touch it will make them to feel like wow we have some better also this is a new concept and so it's a very interesting thing. so yeah, that's all. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Sure, 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 sure. No, 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 no. I'm not going to have any presentation. I'm going to share the ideas.
Uh, a very good morning to one and all present here. With the advancement in technology and its increasing day by day, dependence on devices and internet. This certainly has its positive outcomes, but on the other side, we are increasingly vulnerable to hackers and viruses. For ourselves, the development in technology should be proportional to the development in computer security. On this note, I would like to welcome our esteemed speaker, Dr. Lakshmana Kumar Ramasamy. He is the head of Center of Excellence for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, Hindustan Institute of Engineering and Technology. He's also the ACM Distinguished Speaker and is now part of the Committee of National Defense. Uh, to have you here, sir. And on the behalf of IEEE RAS VIT, we welcome you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, good morning, guys. So, uh, it's really it's honor for me to share my ideas and experience uh, to all the young charms and young minds who are so called as budding researchers and budding uh, I mean, engineers and entrepreneurs. Right. So, coming to the point, like, uh, as the time given to me is a bit short, like 15 minutes, I need to stick to that. So let me make the things very clear and crisp. Right? Uh, so I want to share my experience like what is the importance of robotics and how we are using robotics uh, in the defense. So as far uh, I mean, as far as my experience is concerned, right? Okay, I'm basically working for cybersecurity for government of India. Right? So we are using artificial intelligence a lot, right? So coming to the point, like, so I don't want to speak much about like uh, what is robotics and what is the AI because it's 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 because it's all the it, it's all known terms like you all have already learned a lot of things and experienced a lot of things. But the one part which I want to convey is like cognitive intelligence, right? But nowadays we are working on robots, but it's all I mean it it, it, it there is no semantics involved in the robot. So we are trying to bring cognitive, cognitive intelligence uh, for the robots, which, which helps for simulation and processing of information and knowledge, which in turn generally will capacity in a mission like uh, it can independent like a human behavior, right? So I can tell you like once you use robot, I mean robotic technology into the military applications, we, we are tend to call it as a transfer, transformative technology, right? Because, right? Because we know very well, like we are using this transformative technology. Uh, I mean, in, in basically in social, in economic, and as well as in the military fields as well, right? And uh, I mean, guys, uh, probably you might have uh, heard about there are a lot of uh, I mean, robot applications or robotics are used in mapping technologies. Even we are using in handwriting recognition for main delivery. We are using that. Even we are using for financial uh, trading and surveillance. Even we are using for target acquisition and smart vehicles and so on. Right. But uh, but the agenda of Indian government is a bit different. I'm going to tell you like what are the things they are working on right? and what is the future of Indian defense. Right. And probably you have heard about drones as well. Right. We are using drones for pizza delivery and even uh, drones, I mean, we are using robots for PlayStation games and the self-driven cars, right, okay. But the one part which I want to do is UAV, that is unmanned aerial vehicles, okay, because that is really changing the world a lot, okay, because I am going to tell you, like, what kind of robots are being used in defense, okay. What is our uh, ultimate aim? Because when you when you speak about defense generally, you need to speak about some military applications, right? Because we use and we use multiple options for military applications generally for strategy, for operational, and for generally uh, tactical level of planning, right? Okay. Because you, you, I mean, as far as military application is concerned, there are a lot of things need to be considered, like UAV, I mean, unmanned aerial vehicles, and UGS, we call it as unmanned ground system, right? Because they are the one who can guide us uh, uh, towards the bomb and missile uh, system, right? Okay, so these are the things, but our government is working towards ROV. So what is that ROV? We generally call it as a, it is a remotely operated vehicle, 
Okay, we call that as Daksh Daksh robots. So, so I mean, now Indian government is working towards that because you know when you want to diffuse a bomb, I mean, yeah, the human can divide, but if any error happens, so what's the point, right? So instead of that, government is planning to, I mean, to build a Dutch robots, right? So this robots, generally, we call it as, it's as a, uh, I mean, intra UAV. okay? This, there are a lot of names are for Dutch robots. We have like Preston, we have like Sucher, and we have like Netra UAV. Okay? We use these kind of robots, and in turn, these robots work as like an unmanned UAV, that is unmanned autonomous vehicles, and we use for okay reconnaissance, reconnaissance, and so that is the importance of Dutch robots, right? And from experience, I heard that Indian government, I mean Indian government, have planned to build around 300 to 400 Dutch robots just to defuse explosives, okay? And the import and 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 and, and the another aspect of Dutch robots is like uh, it has the capacity to climb anywhere and to diffuse the bombs. Right. This is one thing. And the next part, which I want to tell you, like, is like, what are the things in which a different sector, the military sector, is planning to do it? Because if you say robotic technology, I mean, we cannot do without AI, right? Okay. So without AI, we cannot do anything. So we need to work on AI as well, right? Okay. So the next level is like uh, bringing, uh, I mean, bringing robotics with artificial intelligence. Because the, I, I can tell you, like the future war is, I mean, the future war can be probably dominated, right? Okay. So this could be uh, dominated by an unmanned systems. Okay. But once you bring artificial intelligence and robotics, especially uh, into a military applications, into a defense sector, I can tell you a few benefits. Like number one is we can work a lot on image interpretation because I can give you example, like say for example, if any if, 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 if any of the enemy is hiding somewhere in some places, we can interpret the image, right? We can we I mean the our target need to be accurate. So we can work on target identification classification. So without EA, we cannot do that. Once that is done, then that that I mean that information is interpreted to the robot submission will take care of the rest of the stuff. Okay, that is one. And the next thing is like, uh, uh, I mean, we have heard about the traditional and conventional weapons. Like we used to buy a lot of weapons, okay, but they are for us conventional and traditional weapons. But what, what we are speaking about export systems, right? Okay. So what is the importance of export systems? Like, so once you work on these export systems, that weapons become more sophisticated. So that, example, I can tell you like radars and missiles. So radars and missiles will, I mean, will become like a sophisticated weapon systems, uh, which is easy for us to diagnose and maintain because that system in turn becomes like an expert system, right? And the next one I want to speak about is precision targeting, right? Because guys, you know, like nowadays we are speaking about precision reforming, precision agriculture. But we are working towards a concept called precision, uh, I mean, precision targeting, right? So as far as military application is concerned, because we know very well, like, uh, th there are two things which is very important in the defense, right? One is called accuracy and next one is called, okay, so carriage of ammunition. Okay? Without ammunition, we cannot do anything. So the two things, so we need to have a precise target. So robots, so robots which we build need to be precise so that we can help robots to give a precise targeting support. That is one area where people are working around, right? And the next thing, like as we are speaking about drones, right? You know, like how drone is transforming everything. But uh, one point I would like to speak about is my um, the weapons. Okay, the, I mean uh, the weapons which we uh, I mean which we use should be shock resistant. Okay, so we need a bit of platform so that it it need to be shock resistant. Okay. Because when you provide some fire play remotely, so you can find a shock, okay? You need to have some shock resistant applications and we are doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not doing it, right? So people are working towards because basically I'm into cyber security where I use a lot of AI applications into the cyber security, right? And, and, and the next thing is like, uh, you might have heard about, uh, I mean, a missile, missile, right? So target range of missile and the, I mean, and, and, and the trajectory analysis that is very important. 
and the, and the trajectory analysis are generally to kill the particular people, right, on the launch time, on the simulation, all need to be assessed, okay? So this, ass this assistance is very important. And uh, if you want to assist this uh, to our robots, I mean, so we need to have the AI hand. Without AI, we cannot perform this in, in different environments, okay? And, and, and the next thing is like, have you heard about like anti-improvised explosive device, okay? Right. Okay. So there are a few uh, gun firing systems, and we generally call that as an anti-improvised explosive uh, device where robots are used. In, instead of humans, robots are nowadays used uh, I mean, to explode, to explode that. Okay, so these are the few I mean areas where government is regularly working. And yes, I am speaking about the government. Uh, I mean, DRDO, what the, what the DRDO is doing, and what the people who are doing. But apart from that, apart from that, there are a few private sectors like uh, my friends are there, right? Okay, so they are working on few robotics with AI, and they are trying to work on the application as well. Because previously they are working only for, uh, I mean, retail. That is only they are working for consumers. Okay, consumers. I mean, especially for goods market. But now they are planning to bring it into our military applications, like companies like Tal, okay, TAL manufacturers, like like high tech robots, like Coco robots, Robosoft systems. These are a few companies which are, you know, para robots, like okay. So they are working on right, making robots for military applications as well, right? And, and, and there are a few foreign companies I want to tell you, like Uran 9, okay? Uran 9 and the one company I don't remember, that's a Swedish company. They are trying to bring some AI and they are working on AI with the robotics for the underwater systems. They're working towards that, okay? And coming to that, Uran 9, I'm completely inspired by Uran 9 because that is, I mean, you, I mean, uh, that is like, it can generally, the, the rate of fire of Uran is like 350 to 400 rounds per minute. That is very huge. Okay? So it can bring a lot of disaster. So people are working towards that, okay? So these are the few areas where I can tell you like uh, uh, defense, I mean, AI and robotics is greatly, uh, I mean, uh, used uh, a lot in defense, right? And I want to tell you, like, once you bring robotics and we can gain a lot of advantages, like, okay, we, 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 we can bring a lot of advantages, like, because you know very well, like, uh, in previously, in 2014, if I'm not wrong, 2014, people have started to speak about robotics. Robotics market was started to build, okay? And by 2017, they started to revise, like, okay, no, if I, I mean, uh, uh, revise the estimate, like in 2014, they start like the, the factor will be X. But by 2017, they started, no, robotics is going to rule the world by 2020, 2030. So they started to improve their, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, their estimate, right, okay? But now I'm telling you, like, the market of robotics, okay, it's really a huge, a huge and huge, okay. And the other thing which I am, I, I mean, I mean, which which I'm a bit concerned is like, okay, because generally I used to read a lot of articles what US is doing, because as far as military application is concerned, countries like US are concentrating on four areas, like they, they concentrate on land, they concentrate on sea, they concentrate on air, and even they concentrate on space. And apart from that, they take entire number of cyber as well, right? Because they use sensors, they use logistics, and the effects, what they use on the command and the control board, they use is immense, right? Because generally, if I say um, land, they use a kind of a sensor laden uh, robotic ground vehicles. Mm -hmm. They use the sensor laden robotic ground vehicles for monitoring the land. If it comes to sea, they use some long endurance autonomous surveillance vehicles. They use long endurance autonomous uh, surveillance when it comes to sea. But when it comes to air, but the same thing needs to be distributed, right? So they are using a different concept called unmanned wingman, okay? Unmanned wingman. So that is difficult. I mean, that is a bit new. And when it comes to space, they are using a, a kind of air enhanced awareness uh, in space. I really don't know what is that because a lot of research is happening in that particular area. And, and, and the next thing when it comes to command and control, because all the communications need to be command and control so that we can get a, a proper intelligence. So they are using autonomous AI processing. Okay? Once they use autonomous AI processing, generally, 
they can bring a cooperative human visual interface uh, so that the augmented decision making can happen right okay so a lot of things are there with the given time like for 15 minutes we cannot discuss uh, a lot right okay uh, so i mean so a lot of things are there because we are doing a lot of research but the time given to me is just 15 minutes so i can sh i cannot share all the ideas that is okay so sorry for this inconvenience so probably i think now it is 10 to 26 i'm sorry i have taken one minute late okay sorry for that no sir no sir So it was a very really nice introduction. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So shall I take a leave? For any questions there? Yes, please. Yeah, 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 done. Thank you guys. All the best, Dover. Bye. Thank you, sir. He's joining now. He's joining now. I just called him. Hey, yes, can you hear me? Perfect, yeah, no problem. I hope I'm audible clearly, right? Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Education is the bridge between humanity and progress. It is what has propagated us from cavemen learning to create fire to modern men impacting areas of progress unimaginable to man at that time. Hey, Technoids, we would like to announce our esteemed speaker for education track, Mr. Victor Sundarat, currently serving as head of engineering academy at Infosys Limited. Mr. Victor Sundaraj completed his Bachelor's of Education in Mechanical Engineering from Bharti Darshan University and MTech in Aerospace Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Mr. Victor Sundaraj 
is a seasoned leader with 20 years of experience in engineering competency development at corporate and academia and has demonstrated effectively, effectively versatile capabilities through roles of leadership, program management, and specialist skills in core engineering. He is now currently leading Engineering Academy, a strategic business partner group which is responsible for developing employees' engineering competencies across the company. We are privileged to have you, sir, and we hope all the participants enjoy the session. Thank you. I hope I'm good to go. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, IEEE uh, Robotics and Automation Society team at VIT. Um, I'm very, very glad to be part of this event today and to address the teams that are going to work on the education sector and even the other sector. So uh, it's really glad to see the students taking charge, reaching out to the experts and uh, coordinating the entire event by themselves. Certainly a, a, a great feeling and, uh, um, uh, and appreciate all of your efforts in, in driving this initiative to this level. Thank you, sir. So um, let me try to share my views in uh, three parts. Um, I'm sure I think all of you will agree. I'm sure uh, you all are the ones who have got impacted as well through this pandemic. And education is one of the most disrupted you know, sector uh, during this pandemic. Right? So we had to miss all our classes. Uh, I think we, are, we still continue to miss the fun of uh, being together in the classes, listening to the faculty, uh, hanging around in the in the college campuses and you know, the canteens, hostels, and so on. I'm sure I think all of you will be missing those wonderful experiences. But nevertheless, um, we need to continue the business, and uh, we have resorted to such uh, uh, digital forums to interact and connect with each other. Um, anyway, um, I'm sure I think we would have seen in many many of the sectors. So digital is catching up, and um, the transformation through digital technologies is also impacting the education sector in the way we learn and the way we practice things, the way we uh, go through the assessment, right? And the entire learning life cycle is being uh, influenced greatly by the digital technologies uh, currently. Well, if you look at it, it's not just colleges, right? It's beginning from the schools to colleges to the higher education, professional education, corporate education sector, upskilling, reskilling initiatives across the globe uh, have gone through uh, you know, several uh, transformations uh, during this period. At the same time, if you look at, there is a huge amount of business potential is also part of uh, uh, this transformation uh, or this particular education sector in itself. It has um, you know, uh, hundreds of billion uh, potential in the, uh, in the market for the education sector. So one example is the recent uh, you know, Baiju's acquiring Akash in itself shows, you know, how this uh, private uh, learning, uh, online learning has the great potential, right, where they were able to acquire it to the order of about 1 billion uh, US dollars. So that itself talks about the potential and opportunities that are available in this particular sector. And also, all of you will also agree, and so there are different modes of learning, right, while I talked about different uh, categories from schools, colleges, higher education, professional education, corporate education, and so on. In every aspect, there is also different modes that are being adopted, right? So it could be synchronous way of learning what we used to have uh, as an instructor led, right? Whether it is in person or the virtual mode of learning or uh, the asynchronous mode of learning completely, you know, self-learning where, uh, you know, we are learning uh, on ourselves at our own time, uh, you know, uh, at our own phase of learning. And there is also the other mode of blended learning where we have a blend of, uh, you know, instructor-led as well as, uh, you know, self-learning, which is part of it. So these are all the, the fundamentals or the foundations of, you know, what we see as an education. So as the next one, I will, let me share with you our own experience of, you know, building these systems, building this automation uh, at Infosys. So at Infosys, we have a very large, uh, you know, team of uh, uh, educators who look after uh, 
the continuous education and the onboarding needs of uh, uh, 250,000 employees at Infosys. Right? I'm sure I think some of you uh, might be aware uh, where we have the world's largest corporate training facility at our Mysore campus, where we train close to about 20,000 engineers at every uh, every year. Right? So we they go through a, a four to uh, five months of uh, induction program at our Mysore campus. We used to do it as a kind of a residential training program. But when we need to close the campus, you know, due to this pandemic and COVID, right? We have to quickly, uh, you know, we cannot abandon those trainings, which is a business need. Right? Uh, without which uh, the business will not uh, you know, grow, will not flourish as the way it was planned. So we need to quickly switch to different uh, modes of learning, right? from an in-person classroom-based learning to uh, virtual and digital modes of learning. So because we had these platforms at our hand, we were able to quickly switch over from an in-person to the digital modes of learning in just about two weeks' time. Right? Now we you know, train more than you know, 20, 25,000 engineers uh, through these platforms. Right? So when we were building this platform three, four years ago, we had this, uh, you know, four core visions in uh, in our mind. I'm sure I think listening to it will definitely give you some more ideas as you, you know, ideate and as you, uh, you know, bring uh, uh, trickle your own thoughts to uh, come out with innovative ideas on the education side. The four core tenets are something like this, making learning convenient, making learning relevant, making it fun and engaging, making it matter. Okay, so these are the four core tenets on which you know, we have built uh, the platform, the talent transformation platform at our own end. When I say making learning convenient, it is learn to facilitate learning anytime, anywhere, on any device, right? Not restricted to some campuses, not restricted to you know, some time, etc. People, whenever they want to learn, they just quickly you know, uh, jump on and learn. Right? And also, they should come to this learning uh, not with a forced mindset. Right? I'm sure I think uh, we don't open Netflix, we don't open Facebook, we don't open WhatsApp because somebody is forcing us to do it. Right? Uh, so the learning or people, when they come to such learning platform, they should have such an uh, you know, inquisitiveness to learn. Right? They should be self-motivated and or should have that particular enthusiasm to come and you know, start learning. So the platform should be made so accessible that you know they should be able to uh, learn anytime, anywhere, uh, right? On and also any device seamlessly switch from mobile devices to laptops to desktops, right? Or iPads or tablet. Uh, should they should have the same level of uh, you know uh, convenience to learn anytime? Should be either browser based or it could be even you know app based, Android devices or iOS devices. Right? So that's the first thing that we felt, I think we should uh, move it away from campuses, make it available on internet so that people will be able to access it you know, anytime, anywhere. At the same time, it should have the same feeling like you know, how you shop in uh, Amazon, how you shop in Flipkart, how you shop in, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or experience things in Netflixes and other things. It should have similar features of recommendations, features of knowing who you are, and accordingly, it should be able to subscribe. So that is actually leading me to the next, uh, the core vision that we had, making learning relevant, right? When I say relevant, it should be, the, the system should be able to see who you are and accordingly recommend you know, what learning content are relevant for you, right? Or who you are as a learner, right? Or where do you stand? And accordingly prescribe you a different phase in which you can learn as well, right? And also looking at from the faculty pers perspective, Right? It should be modular where they, they want to revise some content. Right, They should be able to quickly do it. And as from the learner's point of view, if you are stuck at some problem, you should be able to search for it and quickly get a just-in-time kind of a help. Right, So all those things should be possible in the learning uh, ecosystem. And third aspect is making learning fun and engaging. When I say making it fun and engaging, right, it should have this social features where you are able to uh, you know, discuss and uh, you know, post queries to your own peers and get guidance from your peers or connect with the top performers, right? Or quickly connect with uh, the educators, the faculty members or the experts, or maybe, you know, how you can actually get connected with some of the industry experts, uh, you know, quickly get their suggestions and guidance 
and uh, you know uh, get get uh, uh, you know such support through the platforms and being connected is again you know uh, very much essential not only that um, when i say engaging whatever you are learning you should be also able to practice it uh, at the same time right um, say for example if you are learning something uh, on technologies right there are a lot of sandbox environments for practice right so you shouldn't actually go to uh, find a machine and then find installables and then you know uh, uh, install it go through all those hassles so instead how about just clicking a button it gives you the environment where you are able to practice what you are learning side by side and um, you know you are able to complete your learning there right so that's again another aspect uh, which is very very important and uh, uh, and how about um, you know pushing aspects of gamification in the learning platform right so what you are going to design uh, as a learning content you are going to design it for people who are used to the pubgs and uh, you know all those cartoon char- characters so how you can actually make it more engaging and um, you know gamified environments earning badges to leaderboards to you know, much more things how you can actually bring in as part of uh, Uh, your learning environment is something how you can engage the learners and making learning uh, a much more fun activities for the people around and last vision that we had when we were this, when we were envisioning our platform is making it matter right when i say making it matter it is to see uh, track how people are actually learning right or both at individual learner level are they stuck at some place how we can actually support them or at a different course level to see Uh, how people in that particular course are actually learning um, uh, right or uh, if you look at from the administration hod dean and principal and heads of the institution point of view how they can get a, a view of how the learning is happening in the entire organization or in the entire institution so it is primarily the data analytics how you can actually get the data bisect them dissect them into all the intelligence that is required to drive the learning within the organization right so as you look at it you know we you know we have close to about uh, uh, 250000 of our employees on the platform uh, learning every day um, you know close to about 30000 employees come to this platform to learn every day right with an average of about 45 to 60 minutes and also you know we have uh, you know launched uh, instances of this platform for social learning i'm sure some of you would have used infitq or infosys head start there are more than 1 million users who use this platform so i'm just sharing these things just from our own personal experience now uh, you know some more tips as you uh, as you go along and you know ideate the situation you need to think about you know how you can leverage technology in the learning right i think that's the most important thing what we need to do it how you can automate it uh, from the entire life cycle of learning how you are able to practice how you are able to assess right so i'm sure i think assessment is also another um, you know big area where um, you know people do not have to go to any assessment centers to take up the exams say how about you know taking the exam from a video proctored devices and the device is able to check whether somebody is assisting them somebody is, uh, you know helping them through voice right or if he or she is switching screens to take some assistance so qualifying the test in itself in addition to evaluating the test right so how about integrating all of those environments the playgrounds or the sandbox environments for practice that i talked about and also how we can actually bring in artificial intelligence and machine learning into the uh, system for getting the recommendations the learning recommendations for the learners and um, not only that not only the gamification that i talked about how we can actually bring in immersive experiences in the learning right like this ar vr mr kind of experiences how it can be brought into the learning and the next much bigger thing is uh, how you can actually allow the learners to personalize the learning right they can build their own uh, you know a suite of courses or suite of learning paths with themselves in the way they want to learn and also adaptive learning depending upon how the learner is learning uh, are they able to the system is able to skip some topics or add some topics if he, they are lacking fundamentals right not just in the learning even in the assessments if you are able to you know depending upon the answers that you are getting whether to increase or decrease the complexity of the questions right and uh, the video proctor a uh, video proctor secure environments for assessments and practice and so on so these are all different things um, not only that how we can actually bring in uh, bots into the learning right so the learning digital assistants into the system so these are all different uh, you know things that um, you know i'm sure as you ideate you should look at it 
and holistically you should look at it from you should put yourself in the shoes of a learner in the shoes of a faculty or the trainers or in the shoes of administration the heads of the institutions or the the deans or in the uh, chief learning officers in the organization right or be it um, uh, you know the parents in the case of schools and uh, you know, colleges how we can bring in different stakeholders and build such automations and systems in place right so this is what i had as uh, in a very briefly as my thoughts um, wish you all the very best and um, uh, let's build uh, you know systems of learning and education systems of futures and think about the uh, future stakeholders of this and future technologies how we can bring in into building such learning systems so all the very best teams and thank you uh, team for this uh, great opportunity to interact with you back to you dr nasir or myself thank you so much sir for sharing this uh, these words with us Sorry, are there some questions on the chat window that I need to pick up? All right, fine. All right, thank you, guys. is logging in two minutes
Yeah, yeah, I'll show. Hello, Idea Hunters. The next speaker of the domain of augmented reality and virtual reality technologies is Mr. Raman Salwar, who is the CEO and founder director at Simulanus. Mr. Raman Salwar completed his master's in chemical engineering with honors from the prestigious University of Manchester. He held one of the top ranks and won multiple awards during his stay in the UK. He has also been on the receiving end of several accolades and industry nominations due to his groundbreaking research in a specialist domain. His core interests lie in the development and application of process simulation and optimization models to solve real world problems. As the CEO of Simulanus, he has taken the company to new heights, making it one among the most awarded AR VR companies in India. Simulanus aims on building impactful products and providing services in quick time frames and with limited resources. It is our honor to have such an esteemed personality as part of Idea Find, and I hope all of you will be inspired by his work. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. So yes, a very warm welcome uh, to everyone. Um, in this talk session, I'll be very happy to kind of talk about the journey which we have had and also talk about the industry in general. Um, firstly, uh, in terms of, you know, VR, AR uh, as a track, I'm, I, I was told that that is one of the tracks which, has been, which will be kind of In those slides, um, it's a great idea. Definitely, I think it's very innovative. It has been uh, since 2013-14, since the time we started it. Um, our own journey has taken on a lot of different uh, facets. Uh, we have pivoted um, from consumers to businesses, uh, and understanding where exactly the relevance of modern day XR lies. So, what I can definitely do is I can simply just uh, start by talking about how and what um, XR industry is uh, these days. So back in the day, and I'll, I'll kind of start with what it was back in the day. So in terms of uh, the industry in general, it's been there since the 1960s. Uh, it was started off as an experiment uh, to kind of you know, understand how virtual reality could be used for, uh, for different use cases. Uh, training was one of the first use cases on which it was tried. Then eventually it was funded as a NASA project and then it was in, this, in the 70s and 80s and then it was taken on as a concept by a few gaming companies. Stega was one of the first companies in fact which take it, took it on regards to gaming. And then um, in uh, the subsequent years a lot of research happened in terms of uh, understanding the applications of XR in, cogn in, cog in understanding human cognition, in understanding the behavior and also trying to use it uh, in different aspects of filmmaking as well. So I think the use cases have been there since a long time. It's just that uh, the industries have kind of, you know, adapted the technology of XR in different ways altogether. Uh, these days, uh, of course, in the 2000s, um, a lot of research did take place, of course, and eventually Facebook uh, ended up purchasing Oculus, and that was the start of something which was more, more mainstream VR, as we call it. Um, in the regards to AR, of course, prominent examples uh, which come to mind are the Pokemon Go examples or examples which uh, utilize and leverage uh, open source SDKs, which have been developed by Google and Apple as well, in the form of AR4 and ARKit. So there are a lot of examples online, uh, the lot of game development engines which have come up now, of course, Unity is one which is quite prominent, uh, Unreal being the other. And, and, and a lot of action and a lot of it, all of these uh, open source development engines in a way have democratized the way the uh, budding developers like, uh, like who we have on this, on this panel and on this uh, webinar uh, can, can actively take part in. Uh, all you have to do is simply go onto the websites of these uh, respective uh, engines, Unity and Unreal and get started. 
Um, and I think today, modern day XR is no longer uh, a difficult play as it was uh, back in the day, even in 2014, because even then it was evolving uh, very much. So uh, I think we as a, as a company have started, have, have kind of seen uh, how the early days uh, were. It was very difficult to kind of create awareness. Wherever we used to go with our tech stack, uh, all we used to get was, uh, you know, the wow factor. Uh, but people were very, it was very difficult for people to understand the business applicability and the use case behind XR technologies. So I think that has something which, that has something which has really grown over the years. The awareness levels have grown. Uh, that is the reason why probably BRAR is even a track in this session today. Um, and I think the applications now are simply wide ranging. I, I was uh, I was just going through social media and I keep myself up to date with a lot of action which goes on in the West. Um, even in India, it's really catching up. Uh, you know, the latest uh, IPL which kickstarted yesterday that the the twelfth man in the in the entire IPL season will be people like yourselves joining in through virtual modes. And and of course, the organizers have done a fairly brilliant job to integrate various facets of virtual reality, augmented reality technology. And you know, it's something which is just proving that now. It's becoming mainstream. According to the Gartner cycle, it was a red hot sector, uh, a kind of a sector in which uh, innovation was happening. This was in the in the in the era of 2014-15, uh, where it was very much an upcoming technology. But now, I think this technology itself has has matured over the years. So, entertainment and gaming happen to be very prominent use cases. Um, there are a lot of arcades which have opened up in the world uh, in which the entertainment and gaming use cases are are used. Sony PlayStation consoles have been sold, millions and millions of units have been sold. So definitely there is a tremendous um, you know, need to build something along the lines of VR and AR in terms of gaming. I'm a huge fan of VR AR gaming, even though as a company, we do things which are more on the serious level. Uh, we do things across in industries and build applications for training and productivity. Uh, however, gaming and entertainment across as a consumer uptake is one of the maximum uh, kind of you know, areas where the use case and the uptake has been maximum. Um, Sony PSVR has been selling a lot of units. It's sold more than a million units across, and, and it's definitely one of the ones um, to watch out for in the future. Oculus has gone strength to strength. Um, launching the, the standalone device Quest has made it very, very easy for people to, to grab hold of any VR device and get going. Uh, the consumption of content is at an all-time high. Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook has immense plans to take it to the social network. So I believe the proliferation of VR, AR will actually happen as you see more companies joining in the bandwagon and doing so. And how can we forget uh, Apple, uh, which is doing some great work, uh, but trying to you know launch uh, their early designs of uh, their headset. Uh, their their idea and their version of VR and AR is something which is quite spectacular. They intend to kind of blur the lines of distinction between VR and AR. And what they want to do is they want to develop a headset, and they are coming up with a headset which can actually allow you to do both. Uh, in using a concept which is called the pass through. So a lot of technologies there, a lot of auxiliary technology companies have been built up. Uh, there, is, there is action happening on haptic gloves, so you can actually wear gloves and you can build them. That's a great ide ideation uh, for you all as well. Um, and of course, there are a lot of other actions happening around the haptics and 4D uh, simulations as well. So what, what, what that means is that you can actually build in effects like things which are complementing to the 3D experience of what you get in VR, for example, you know, having a smell effect or having a, a sensory effect or a heat effect. And if you could integrate all of these components into a typical VR application, I think that's something which is quite a spectacular end result. So I think since this entire talk is about ideation, you know, that's a that's a framework which I would like to share as well. In this call. It's, it's, it's something which we use a lot in, in, in terms of, you know, building new things. And that's about combining a lot of different aspects of different technology areas and, and, and just combining them to kind of have uh, an end output, which is quite spectacular. So this could take a different forms. You know, you could potentially look at uh, taking a, taking an idea and, and in, in kind of implementing it in another dimension. Um, for example, if you are using VR for, let's say, uh, a, a very serious use case, you could think of VR being used in a different context altogether. Uh, similarly, uh, if you want to kind of, you know, build an idea, then there are a lot of ways in terms of making things better. So there are adjectives which can be used, for example, if Currently, a technology is is doing things in a certain way. Then, how can you use XR or VR to make it better, faster, cheaper? So, I think these these areas are the uh, these are sort of ideation techniques are what I feel quite important for you to kind of think along the lines of building something unique. Uh, there's a lot of use cases. There are a lot of use cases out there. Uh, medical surgery is one of them. Of course, you can pick them out. Uh, engineering construction is one of them. 
um, you know, just getting access to of it, uh, getting giving people access to information in a in a scalable format is something which I would definitely uh, like to go go for. And in terms of the trends of the future, I think scalability is what is what very important. So for all the budding building uh, like uh, uh, people who are kind of building things uh, from scratch, I would always recommend them to to you know go with technologies which are scalable. So so web uh, and the browser offers a lot of opportunities to scale content and i would say that whatever you're trying to do uh, just push your technologies on that medium and platform as much as you can um, and if of course of course if there is cross compatibility and you can have mobile based uh, frameworks involved into it as well that can also make a lot more sense um, in terms of the, the the real essence of vr i believe the real or xr as they say uh, is is data the power of everything which you do in vr on an ar landscape is all what you can do with the data which comes out of it Single sessions in VR or AR played by, by users can throw so many data points that if you have the right analytics engine, you can really make a sense out of it. So I believe data analytics is also one of the very key fields of what you can look at as an ideation uh, within this field. So, so just to summarize, um, social gaming, um, getting something scalable online, uh, and the trend which is very important these days is something which is you know trying to make sure that you have um, you know things which are very much uh, accessible to people uh, because long and uh, very uh, it's it's been talked about that vr has been um, you know kind of not kind of catch uh, caught upon uh, the, the the some of the other technologies which are there because a simple reason that um, the hardware makes it a bit inaccessible so if you, the more you focus on things which are not hardware focused and hardware driven uh, the better you can actually get in terms of applying that use case at scale and mass I personally believe that the VR is very successful if you scale it up. Uh, that's what we tell our customers that uh, post a certain level of deployment, uh, VR only starts to give the benefits when uh, it is used and deployed at scale. So that's another message to people that don't get disheartened if, if the applications are not receiving that level of traction when you build them. Uh, it's very important to, to see how you can actually you know, uh, see out the application in terms of uh, usage the more you use them, of course, the better it becomes. And that's something which is very, is very important to scale uh, things up at a tech level. So these are some of the trends uh, which I had. And one of the very important trends which I also wanted to throw at people, which is shaping up currently, is the entire concept of having virtual events as well as you know having virtual uh, meeting spaces and collaboration spaces. We are doing this over a, over a Google Meet platform, but that's the ideation which I throw out at people. If they are talented enough and they, they feel that they are they are working on the next big idea, try to think of ideas which can actually make this entire space into a virtual space, you know, and 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 make people collaborate with each other in that in their avatars in their form with forms of avatars. Now that's a very important uh, that's a very big task. It's 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 easy to say, of course, but there is so much uh, which which has to be done to make this a reality. So that's another idea which I can throw out throw out at people in terms of building something great. Um, and I think overall, all of these areas are kind of, you know, uh, the, the areas which, which I believe, you know, capture the entire, uh, the, the XR sun, as I call it, the solar system of XR, as I call it. So um, the other very important element and aspect is the hardware element. Um, if people are interested, if people are interested in building electronics and if they're interested in building hardware, I know India as a country has historically been very much behind in terms of building hardware at that level, but I feel that's, that's the big opportunity the way I see it. Uh, we still don't have an India-based HMD builder uh, or, a, or, a, or a company which can actually build H HMD uh, head-mounted displays or heads-up displays at scale. We only see and hear of companies like Oculus, Facebook, um, your Sony's and your HTC's of the world build, making these devices. Why can't an Indian company do that at that level? We do everything, but why not this? So that's something which is, again, uh, an idea which can, again, this is a very, very, it's easier said than done. I know there are a lot of challenges which the country currently poses in terms of building hardware, uh, especially at a chip level, uh, you know, manufacturing of PCBs for that matter and stuff. But of course, being uh, visionaries and, and being budding students and, and, and being the youth of, of, of who, who you are or all on the call, I would, of course, push you in that direction of making uh, this a reality and ensuring that, you know, companies can benefit from, from such intervention. So I think um, these are some of the uh, overall uh, themes or around which, uh, um, of course, I've centered my call, my my talk on um, just to make sense out of it all. Uh, try to think, the, try to think about the finish line. I would say 
try to think about the end experience. There are a lot of tools which you can use. Uh, ideation, of course, is very important at the first stage. The next important stage, as per any design thinking curriculum also, is, of course, prototyping. Um, and prototyping is very, very important in the VRAR standpoint. So uh, the quicker you can prototype things, the, the better, feed, the, 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 the sooner you can get feedback, I think the more important it becomes. And if you're really thinking of starting out and building a business out of all these ideas, which I've just thrown at you all, um, do think about the business model canvas. Uh, that's a very important technology. That's a very important technique, not a technology, but the technique which is being used uh, a lot uh, to kind of you know define, refine, uh, define and refine business ideas. So, so if you have a, if you have an idea, of course, if it makes a lot more sense to you right now, but try to think of how it can actually make a commercial business sense to uh, the world at large and the impact uh, which can be created. So. You have to view the entire solution from an impact perspective as well. So it has to not only make business sense, but it has to make an impact sense as well. Because at the end of the day, everything in the world out there tries to do something or the other in a sustainable manner. And that's the next big push our technologies are, are going towards. Everything is turning towards sustainability and making sure that you know the, the environment and the nature around us is also looked at. So these are these are massive areas in which people really uh, ideas have to have to turn their attentions towards. Um, and this is something which, of course, as a recipe uh, for what you can build, I've given out. Uh, there are a lot of other tools out there. Reach out to me offline if you need support in terms of some other tools. Um, just to make it work, uh, you really need to brush up on skills which require like basic skills like prototyping, uh, quick prototyping. It needs a, if you need, all need support in that, happy to support. And also very important is thinking of the commercial aspects of it because sometimes you know thinking the end at the very start makes the journey a lot more easier than what you can uh, what you can think of and and these are some of the key core issues which you'll grapple with anyways in the time to come so my thoughts would always be to to build something which makes sense because otherwise there's no point in building it so ideation also needs to have a logical end course so that's my uh, best advice to the students uh, very happy to take questions out there of course if there are any other questions i can take to make it a very flowing conversation happy to do that yes sir Thank you for such an ins insightful speech. So the first question uh, was actually given by our previous speaker. She spoke of how the pandemic has affected the current trends in the field of VR. And mm. could you uh, elucidate on that? Absolutely. So pandemic has really changed uh, the way people think about VR technologies or AR technologies. Uh, yeah, but the point is, it's it's a bit of a myth, really. If you ask me, being yeah. a really practical person, I think people, everybody will think that pandemic has come in and it has changed the polarities and shifted the goalposts and everything. But to be honest, uh, the industry of VR AR was not ready to even deal with the pandemic that way because we were not able to scale technologies as fast as yeah. we would have liked for the pandemic. So I would say, yes, the, the long-term picture is clear that people need it, businesses need it. But the road to adoption is, is still not waved out. And that's the big challenge. So that's an opportunity. I would still say being in the industry, I can still see your company, see companies struggling uh, to adapt to VR, AR technology. And I think at the consumer level as well, um, it's, it's not trickled through. So I think uh, there is opportunity there. Uh, the trends are, of course, for the future. Uh, future trends are shaping up well. Uh, industry is slowly opening up, but a lot has to be done still to make it consumer mainstream. That's my answer. Yes, sir. So I think we'll have to stop it here. It's time constraints. No worries. No, no worries. Yeah. No worries. But, uh, uh, I think uh, we'll be, we'll be added to a Discord server, so I, the participants will ask you their questions there if they sure. have any. Sure, happy to Thank be a part of it. This. Thank you, Aditya. Thanks for having me on the call. Yes, sir. Thanks for the speech. Sure. Thank you.
Uh, let me know if you guys can see my screen. Oh, okay, 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 no problem. Voice is breaking, your voice is breaking. Frame cannot hear you, sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, Prem, for, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you, the organizing team, for having given me the opportunity to be part of this event, ID of Mind. I want to just thank Kalp Tharuvans because he's been following me, uh, following with me for over 15 days now uh, to join this event. So thanks him, thanks VIT, IEEE, and all the organizing team for having me here at this platform. Uh, I understand that there is a time crunch, so uh, I'll, I'll try to keep the discussion or if, you, if this is uh, scheduled as a talk, very precise, and I'll keep the pointers focused that would help you in actually coming up with an idea or an MVP if you could come up uh, by the evening. So these uh, talking points would really be helpful to you. Just uh, let me know when you can see my screen, and uh, I should be uh, going with that. Can you guys see my screen? You can, you can see it. One second, maybe I'll, I'll just make some adjustment to this. Can you see it now? Okay. You can all see. Oh, so perfect. So it's 11.45 now. Prem, can you just tell me what time I have to stop? Till 12. Okay, I have 15 minutes. I think that's a good time. 
So uh, I am not sure uh, how much you all know about supply chain logistics, or transportation, freighting, shipping, and shipment. So I'll consider that you just have a basic understanding from your day-to-day uh, -day interaction or the way you uh, do your day-to-day -day regular life trade. And uh, I, I just understand. I just take it at, at that level. So uh, I'll try to give you an overview of what supply chain is, what logistics is, what are the uh, what are the things which are happening in the Indian Indian market, and what could be the next big thing in this industry. So firstly, uh, it is it is one of the greatest time we are living in uh, if it comes to supply chain professionals. So the COVID has actually given a lot of weightage to this industry. Uh, if you go back and read somewhere, you'll understand that supply chain, logistics, transportation, uh, a function which was a mix of marketing, finance, merchandising. And it was never an independent structure in our body. So now if you look into big companies, they have got a chief supply chain officer, which means companies now recognize supply chain as one of the core or important part of their business. Now, before I enter into what supply chain is, I just want to show you this particular image. I think most of you would have seen it on, on social media or in news at least. This is the uh, picture from the latest Swiss canal where this ever given container got stuck and it further led to the blockage of close to 400 containers. Now, what I'm trying to show you with this image is particular incident has caused a lot of disruption in the global supply chain industry. Why so? Because this container itself was, was carrying items uh, and the blockage which it, had caused, which it was carrying, the worth of those items was around $9 billion a day. Uh, so, sorry, the losses which these uh, containers were carrying were causing a loss of close to $9 billion across the globe. So now you imagine the amount of goods and materials which get transported across the world uh, on a daily basis. So that's why this is this this thing has now caused a disruption. Now it is forcing people like us to think that how can we avoid such a situation? Now it was maybe because of a strong wind or some other thing, a natural thing which is not under our control that this incident happened. Using data analytics, predict that this thing might come and we can take a safer route, right? Or how can we deploy uh, some sort of analytics where uh, we, we have already have a forecast in place. So we can do temperature forecast. We do weather forecasting, right? So can we deploy some sort of technologies into these, uh, these uh, shipping vehicles? Think into different, uh, we can think differently. So, so as to avoid delays into shipments, each delay in a safe shipment is costing $9 billion uh, because of, because of this thing, right? Now, what were the items which were there in this? The items were your, uh, oil, there were uh, merchandising like cloths, your tools, your toys were there, clothing was there, apparels were there, a lot of things were there, right? So the prices were rising throughout the globe because there were 400 ships which got stuck to it. Now, look into the supply chain. Now, one country which has managed that has put it into a ship and that ship is going through some Swiss canal or maybe any other canal and going to some other country that country somebody will take those items and will put it in their store and sell it right so now this is this is called supply chain that is somebody who's manufacturing to somebody who's selling the entire process in between so the manufacturer he procures raw material he manufactures it sends it to the dock from dock it put it is put in a ship the ship takes it to the another port from another port somebody takes it and send it to whoever wants to sell it and finally customer buys it supply chain what is your logistics Logistics is something which is internal to your organization. For example, I am a manufacturer. If I want to uh, buy some raw material, I'll send my truck to my vendor from whom I buy my raw material, I bring it back. That is my logistics. In this event, they have arranged a video call or a video session for this. They have tested, uh, they've got a speaker for this. So this is logistics management. They have arranged things on their own for their internal event. This is logistics management. Transportation and freighting, as you all know, it is. Uh, moving goods from one place to another. So this was just to give you an idea as to what uh, supply chain logistics and transportation looks like. Today's supply chain management is very critical because it includes everything, right from your procurement to your data analytics, to time tracking, planning and distribution, everything. How you are going to utilize all of these things? Now look at the following examples. Uh, Prem, are you able to hear me clearly? Okay, 
so uh, i'll 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 show you three stories and these three stories will become the basis of your idea i feel so this is the story of bharat where you see brick and mortar kind of a thing a highly unorganized market where they are able to sell clothes they are able to sell you toys on a traffic signal they are sitting somewhere in some corner of your city and uh, city and selling you vegetables and fruits somebody is selling and selling you the groceries or what we call as kirana now this is the story of bharat the retail world in india is predominantly 90% unorganized this is the story of real india now you need to have some solutions for these people how can they actually track their inventory if they have ordered say the sari vendor let's say he has ordered 10000 kanjivaram sari from somewhere how can he track that the shipment is shipped where it has reached when it will reach him then it comes to his system and how many ever he is selling so kind of a erp for somebody like him it needs to be affordable it needs to be uh, it needs to have ease of uh, utilization for him because he might not be that qualified to you this is just an example so you need to look around thinking some solutions for them number 2 story of india story of india is a story of people like us who are sitting in big metros like bangalore mumbai delhi kolkata hyderabad chennai or some cities some other 10 20 cities like that where we have got organized retail where we have got e-commerce players so you using your mobile phone you can now order in the post covid era or you can visit a store by taking appointment you can pick items from the store so that is story of india now these are big players what these people can do to optimize their operations of supply chain now tatas they run they run one grocery store which is tar bazaar they run one store called as west side they run another uh, store called as tata tenaria sari store now they have multiple forums to do all of that they don't they have not brought all of these things together like reliance has done to its reliance market right so what what they can what they can do to optimize their supply chain there is tata click which is the e-commerce site of tatas so where they where they sell all of their electronic items clothing and everything else uh, through e-commerce they have done a partnership with flipkart to get the delivery faster and list their uh, home list their consumer products like dal salt spices and other things so these are some of the things the uh, players are doing in india third is the story of new india which is the problem solvers which is you so now ninja cart has solved one problem for farmers where they go to the farm they pick the vegetables they pay the right amount to the uh, to the uh, farmer and then they take that items and put it properly in the boxes and give it to the sellers in the cities or uh, nearby small towns and then those vendors also get it for the right price now what is happening in this exercise is farmer doesn't have to spend money in uh, transporting transporting these things to the uh, nearby mandi nor these people who sell these within our cities in our neighborhood they have to go to those mandis so ninja cart has taken care of that transportation they have built a app where you can uh, you can locate a store and buy online so ninja cart has solved one problem now there could be some problem with ninja cart if you can identify that problem and solve that that's a idea for you that's a idea hack for you paytm paytm has become one stop shop for anything and everything today but they have revolutionized uh, payments they are the market leaders for digital payments be it the wallet payment be it the upi payment or even they have the uh, debit card now even credit card i use both of them so paytm has solved one of the problems in india which was people's hesitation to use online payments now you go to the remotest of villages there is if even if they are not using but they know that payments can be made through paytm you can pay to your tea vendor those 5 or 10 rupees using your mobile phone so they have that visibility Ulan Ulan has solved problems for the small vendors. They have given that, them that handheld device where they can put in their inventory in that. They can uh, they can do a whole lot of ERP function in that. But can the functionalities of Ulan be further simplified for the story of India, right? Those small vendors. That's the ninety percent market which is there. So if you build a product and of the ninety percent market, if you capture one percent there, you are you are a unicorn. You are you are a big player, right? so odan is solving some of the problems for the story of bharat government of india has started their own e-commerce platform and those e-commerce platform is called gem so you can list your product sell products their online payments are there you would have read in newspaper the prime minister keeps tweeting that uh, government is doing a lot of procurement through this so uh, how can you uh, enable somebody the biggest challenge with gem is to do the product setup even i um, i was trying to do some setup at amazon flipkart paytm and gem for one of my relative 
they ask a lot of questions. Can you make a tool which actually does this for us? So we just scan the document of our product list of all the product details, and then your system can pick up those details, go and fill in uh, fill in those details in Gem Portal, Amazon Seller Portal, Flipkart Portal, or something. So people, so you need to become that enabler, that technology enabler, because people cannot, uh, people don't understand what is the dimension of your product. But you might have that dimension on a printed thing from uh, of the product from where you have procured and you are reselling it, right? So these are some of the challenges common men faces. Interesting thing which is happening in the logistics and transportation space today is the direct to guest. So if you order something to a vendor, they manufacture it, ship it, and you directly receive it at home. So you neither go to a shop or you don't talk to them, but through a website, you just understand that these people, uh, these people are the manufacturer. You understood that they took your order, they manufactured it and shipped it. So Wakefit is, I've taken an example here. They manufacture mattresses. So I don't know if they own the factory, if they own it's good. If they don't, they would have outsourced from somebody. So they will manufacture as per Wakefit's requirement. Then they have taken a vendor partner as delivery. So delivery will go and pick that item from the factory and will ship it to your home. So this is all supply chain. Wakefit is managing multiple vendors and ultimately product is received by the customer, which is direct to customer, D2G. Can you do something in this space? What delivery went ahead and they said, I can make these operations a little faster. So they did a, a tie up with Volvo. They are doing a lot of automation within their warehouses. So this is a new space that how can you help people into direct to guest strategy? Maybe can can you link Quran to direct to guest strategy? I don't know. You have to think about it. There is a lot of uh, thing which is happening in electric vehicle space. So a lot of electric vehicles are coming into robotics. Robotics is coming into uh, into supply chain. So Flipkart has recently deployed close to hundred uh, uh, close to hundred robots in its Bangalore facility. Now industry is interlinked. If you look at it. The biggest challenge in India is uh, our supply chain logistics cost is at around 14%, while globally, the logistics and supply chain cost is 8%. So if India has to become a manufacturing hub for Atman Irbar Bharat, it needs to reduce, these, reduce the cost of supply chain and logistics, which means transportation costs need to reduce, India need to have a logistics policy, and we need to bring in more system upgradation, more technology, right? Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, so, okay, let, let's, let's just go through this. Uh, some important thing, the CO2 emissions from logistics, which means the transportation is at around 7% in India. Can you reduce the CO2 through vehicles? I don't know. You need to look at it. Uh, there is 40% agricultural production waste. So whenever the food grains and fresh vegetables and fruits are transported, 40% of it goes, it goes as waste. While in US, it is just 10 or 15%. Can you reduce that, right? Then some of the growth drivers for India are the e-commerce. We know e-commerce has picked up like anything. 3PL and 4PL are third-party uh, logistics, fourth-party logistics, so you don't own your truck, but you outsource it with somebody. Labor and technology. So we need more skilled labor. We need to employ more technology. GST has simplified things, but uh, different states tend to levy different taxes. Multimodal connectivity. We read about the... Sagar Mala project and Bharat Mala project. So government of India has come up with a multimodal connectivity where something which comes on a port, how it can be sent to other part of the country using road or railways. So they are doing a multimodal connectivity using Sagar Mala and Bharat Mala project. The other thing which will help you is I'm skipping some of the slides just to come to this slide. These five points, these five points, if you work upon, you, you get something. Fragmented does not have an organized logistics player. The biggest logistics player in India could be the Mahindra Logistics, could be VRL, could be Gati. But look at the size of India, 130 crore people, 36 states and union territories, but hardly a handful of uh, logistics, huge logistics players in India. So can, how can you become the Uber or Ola of the logistics or transportation industry? There is nobody who's doing this. Maps and routing. So there are Google Maps which help you and me to navigate through cities using our cars, two-wheelers, and reach a point, but there are no maps or routing system available for trucks. So you would have seen those boards that after uh, the trucks can go only after 10 p.m. in the city, no entry for truck on this particular road. So can you make those maps only for trucks that will save a lot of time for them? It many times they get stuck. Real-time visibility. So when we don't have real-time visibility, we have visibility for our items at a note-to-note -note level. Your item is picked from the vendor in Bangalore. 
the item has reached the facility in chennai the item has reached the facility in delhi and finally the item has reached to your destination in indore but i don't get to see between bangalore to chennai where where, where is it so there is no real time tracking for the truck owners or the logistics partner even they get to know once that once their truck reaches somewhere else so this will help them have a real time uh, real time visibility as to how much time their truck is taking at which place although they have got gps trackers but uh, the systems are very inefficient cold supply chain is very poor in india and not many players are there future group is doing some some, some things in that space so cold supply chain is very essential in india because some parts of the country produce amazing fruits and vegetables and it does not reach the other parts of india where there is a uh, supply uh, supply uh, there is a low supply for that or uh, but a demand is there so building cold supply chain getting those trucks and warehouses having cold supply chain capabilities is important lastly is the sustainable practices which means becoming more environment friendly reducing plastic using more solar thing and uh, reducing waste that's it that is sustainable practice these are five things i believe if you think about these things you might come up with a idea hack for any particular sector uh, i am 2 minutes over shot maybe if i can take one more minute so these are the things you could actually look at when you are building your idea that is the robotic automation process how can you use analytics for that uh, what is agile and adaptive supply chain and uh, the things of future are the iot uh, warehouse automation robotics which means automated sortation automated inbound outbound uh, outbound uh, process within a within a rdc uh, or within a warehouse also uh, in the warehouse uh, how can you actually reduce number of human touches so currently if you look at flipkart's model uh, you order something somebody some person goes to the uh, warehouse he picks up the item packs that item and uh, ships it to to some vendor but how can you automate that that you have ordered something a robot goes picks it up so reduce those number of touches so these are something uh, which could be actually done in the logistics supply chain space and with these thoughts i'll i'll leave you i think this was a uh, topic on which i can go on length and it needed some time but uh, we had 15 minutes i took 18 uh, so thank you so much for having me here being patient with uh, with me so thank you so much and i wish you all the best you come up with some of the bright ideas which we can uh, have a look at the evening thank you so much thank you sir uh, thank you for join, uh, joining and uh, sharing your knowledge with the participants so uh, the participants will be asking the questions through discord so you can interact with them there thank you sir okay um no bhaiya um hello hello bhaiya can you hear me an announcement All the participants are requested to create a TaskKid account. We'll be circulating a form for the login IDs to avail some of our exciting rooms. The TaskKid link has been shared in the Discord channel. The requirements for the first review are on the website and will be announced on the Discord channel. Information regarding the second review will be given after the first review. We request you to keep track of further announcements in the Discord channel, and we'll clear all further queries in the Discord channel.